So let me introduce myself for those of you who have no idea who I am. Um, I am a professional fine art travel photographer. It's my full-time career. Um, I am one of 10 sponsored Sony artisans of imagery worldwide. And I basically do what I love for a living. Um, and I find that when I give a lot of presentations about my career or my travel photography, um, the most common questions that I get after are, how did you get to where you are today? And I think that that's a completely valid topic to cover because whenever I see inspirational people that I follow or people who I don't really know their work but I'm interested in knowing more about them, I want to know the context. Like what, what made them start doing what they do and why do they do what they do? Why do, you know, what makes me wake up and write and do photography? Like what's my motivation? Um, so the last time that I was here, I had a really cute presentation with all of my earlier photography when I started six years ago. Um, and I kind of showed this really interesting progression of my not so awesome images and when I did parade photography up until when I'm doing my um, client-based photography and commission shoots like what you see on the screen. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm going to blame it on the cold. I do not have that presentation for you today. Um, I do have my regular portfolio collection, which is my, most of them are like my commission images or images that have been used professionally. So what I am going to do is I'm going to tell you the story of how I got to where I am. And I, while I'm doing it, I'm going to scroll through the images from my portfolio collection. And if something kind of links to what I'm already speaking about, I will totally address it on the screen. So how did I start out with this? Um, I don't have a typical story in that I wasn't a little girl and I you know, had all these aspirations of being a photographer. In fact, when I was really little, I played music. It was my main means of expressing myself. Um, I play classical piano. I've played it since I was three. And I used to write quite a bit as well. Um, I had a very difficult home life growing up. Um, my parents were extraordinarily religious. And by the time that I was 16, I was kicked out of the house and I was completely disowned, um, meaning that my parents didn't want to have anything to do with me. And they also announced that they were going to move 2,000 miles away to New Mexico and didn't want me going with them. Um, now, in my 16, 17-year-old head, I knew I wanted to stay in New York City. I didn't want to move somewhere else. And so I was really determined to make things happen for myself. So I took out a bunch of student loans, um, lived off the student loans for a couple of years, and I put myself into art school because that was pretty much the most rebellious thing I could think of doing at the time, because my parents didn't really believe in higher education, certainly did not care at all about art or art school. Um, and so for me, I was like, yeah, I'm going to art school. So I went to art school. Um, I went there for like two years, got a degree in textile design. It was FIT. And then I didn't really know what I wanted to do, like most people who go to college super early. Um, and I went to a community college after that, and I majored in costume, like restoration and design and history and art history. But because I was trying so hard to survive in New York on my own, I was literally working three or four jobs a week, um, basically seven days a week. Um, for many, many years. So I ended up dropping out of the community college before I got my bachelor's and just to basically stay afloat and keep myself going in New York. Um, so I did that throughout my 20s. Um, I got to like my late 20s and I was kind of over it. <laughs> you know, I was just like, I can't keep doing this for another 10, 15, or 20 years because I still really loved New York, but you know, I, I just couldn't foresee a future where I was still working these like ridiculous dead-end jobs. 
Um, so I decided to take a leap of faith. And I was like, I want to go and finish my bachelor's degree. So I was just about to turn 30. And I took out student loans again. I'm like, hey, I'm already in debt. <laughs> I may as well go more in debt. It's the American dream. And put myself back in school. Um, and so I think to kind of prove something to myself, and maybe because I had worked so many really bad jobs, I went back to school for pre-med. <laughs> I never do anything half-assed. <laughs> so I went back for pre-med, and it was really stressful to quit working after almost a decade of like constantly knowing I had money coming in, even though I hated what I was doing. So I was like just a big ball of stress. Plus, the, the workload was completely insane. And I had just moved to the Lower East Side from Upper Manhattan. And in order to sort of de-stress and, you know, not think about my situation or my finances, I would walk around a lot in Manhattan because walking is free and because it was just a really great way to kind of empty my mind. But while I was walking around, I really, really, really loved everything that I was seeing. And it made me think a lot about when I was younger, and when I was dealing with a lot of trouble at home and how I used to write a lot and play music to sort of escape what I was going through. And I thought to myself, you know, it'd be really cool if I could somehow find a way to record what I'm seeing on these walks. Because I was seeing some really beautiful things and they were touching me and very resonating. Um, but I wanted a really cool way to like record it. Um, and I didn't have a lot of money. Again, I was completely broke. Um, having just taken out a tremendous amount of loans. And at the time, it was 2009, and a lot of people were using smartphones. That was like the super big thing. But I couldn't even afford a smartphone plan or a smartphone. So I went on Amazon, and I didn't even have $100 to spend. So I looked for a camera that would be under $100. And I found something on sale. It was $79. and I was like, cool, this is going to be awesome. So it came from Amazon, and it was broken. <laughs> and I didn't want to deal with returning it, because I'm really lazy when it comes to that. So I was like, look, it's, it's a camera. I can just play with it, whatever. So I started bringing the camera with me on these walks that I was going on to de-stress myself and taking all of these photos. And I amassed this like huge pile of photos of the Lower East Side, of the East Village, um, I would walk all the way up to Midtown sometimes and then back. And I asked a friend of mine, you know, what, I really like the pictures that I'm taking, but I want to see them in a more beautiful, curated place rather than just in the folders on my computer. Um, you know, like, what should I do with these? Like, is there any sort of website or something online that I should do? And my friend said, well, why don't you just start a blog? Um, and so I went home that night, and I literally Googled the word blog. <laughs> and the first result was Tumblr, because Tumblr is this social network that had just sort of released that, well, I think it was like a year previous, but it was super hot. So it was the top search result. And I clicked on it. I made a blog. I called it NY through the lens, because it was New York through my lens. And I started putting stuff up on the blog. Um, so, I mean, I, I had used the internet before. Um, I had a live journal, if anybody knows what that is. Um, and I, you know, I had all these kind of really weird lapses with the internet where I would write and stuff and share art, but I never really shared my own stuff. And what was really interesting was within the first three months of me sharing my work on Tumblr, I amassed around 30,000 followers. And then it shot up to 60,000. And I was just completely floored. Like I would get all of these messages from people. And I wasn't posting super epic photos. Um, and again, this is where the other presentation comes in. I was just posting regular photos of the East Village, um, Lower East Side mainly. And I was really just sort of like taken aback. Like I. I had never thought of anybody caring at all about 
anything that I did artistically um, to that extent. And so while that was happening, I also got approached by the New York Times. Um, the New York Times had just started a hyper-local news blog about the East Village, and they asked if I wanted to basically do photo essays for them. Um, and I said, sure. <laughs> I'm not going to say no to the New York Times. So I said, sure, and it was a really great experience. Um, I basically spent three or four months working directly with New York Times editors and editors from NYU, because it was a program in conjunction with NYU. I was not going to NYU. I was going to Hunter. I, can't, I couldn't afford NYU. Um, but I got to basically work with them and see what went into making a photojournalistic piece. Um, and of course, getting my hopes dashed as a writer, every time I would submit my writing for these photo essays and you know, going through the rigorous editing process of, yeah, so I like that you wrote two paragraphs for this one photo, Vivian, but I think we're going to condense it down to this one sentence, <laughs> stripping out like all of my adjectives and you know, descriptive speech. So I, I sort of started realizing that I wanted to do something a little bit more creative than photojournalism, and I wanted to do something that kind of let me have a little bit more freedom. Because what I was discovering while I was doing photos was that what I see and how I experience New York is so different from how everybody else experiences it. And I'm sure that every single one of you, how you experience things in your life, it's completely informed by your influences, by how you grew up, by all the things you've watched in your life, by music that you've listened to. So I wanted to find a way to kind of like translate all of those things that were running around in my head into my vision of New York. Um, and so I started playing around a lot with free editing software, because again, I still didn't have money. New York Times was not paying me you know, a six-figure salary. <laughs> um, so I, there was this great editing software called GIMP. Um, it was free. It had a terrible interface. And I would just sort of like play around endlessly with the photos that I took to try to sort of bring out all the tones and colors or even the black and white moods, things that would make me recall everything that I was thinking of when I looked at a scene. So, you know, when I look at this scene that's in Central Park, you know, I'm seeing it like this because it just reminds me of like all of the classic um, New York cinema that I've watched over the years. I grew up on this steady diet of musicals, Woody Allen movies, um, Scorsese, <laughs> a lot of very like flights of imagination types of visions of New York. Because you know the New York and Woody Allen movies and the New York and Scorsese movies, that's not really the New York that exists in reality. But it's a New York that appeals to people in some way because you see things that remind you of certain things or there's universal elements. So while I was doing that, I started getting approached a lot um, about people wanting to use my work for album covers and for book covers. And I started running into the limitations of my broken point and shoot. <laughs> um, a lot of limitations, because of course, the file sizes were way too small for some of the things that people wanted to use. Because I wasn't using Photoshop, I didn't properly really know how to resize things as well. So I asked a friend, um, I said, look, I need to move up to a big girl camera. Um, do I get a Canon or do I get a Nikon? Because I knew nothing at all about photography. Um, and all I knew was that every time I heard people talk about photography, it was either Canon or Nikon. And my friend, who is a very um, contrarian, techie programmer guy, um, said to me, why would you get those? Why don't you go for Sony? Sony is doing some really interesting things. So this was 2009, 2010 at this point. And you know, I, I was like, really? That's really interesting. So I looked it up, and I thought it was really cool that there was this whole other brand that was doing some really interesting stuff, but not a lot of people used it. And they had cameras that were in a really attractive price point for me at the time, because I didn't have $2,000 to spend on a body. 
I did have like maybe $400 or $500. So I got a Sony. So Sony was my first um, DSLR. So I got a Sony A55 was my first one. And that sort of like really opened up this whole new world to me because I went from shooting on a point and shoot to shooting with something that had regular DSLR settings or, you know, had a manual mode, <laughs> which was just so eye opening. And so, again, I had looked online and somebody had recommended if you ever upgrade your camera, make sure you shoot in manual mode. And I was like, okay. So I put the camera in manual mode and I took the worst photos I've ever taken <laughs> of my life for like two months straight. Like every single day I would go out and like, I, I'm very much, I've always been like this in my life. I do not like instruction manuals. I do not like reading instructions to things. I absolutely hate it. I need to do something to learn it and I need to see where it goes wrong in order to learn it because then I can figure out like, okay, it went wrong in that way so I know I need to like do it this other way. So basically I just taught myself about ISO, about aperture, about shutter speed, shooting in manual mode and trying to figure out how I could just get a normal looking photo <laughs> that didn't look terrible basically for two months. Um, and it was great. It, it let me learn a lot about light, about times of day, about the best time to shoot, about you know what times of day I liked to shoot because I was shooting so much trying to figure this out that like I started learning, you know, okay, there are some things that I seem to gravitate to a lot. Um, and so it's just this really great experience. And so I shot with the Sony and I started putting my stuff up more online. Um, an element that also played into kind of how I grew my social media presence was that because of Tumblr and because of all the support I got from that network, I decided that I really wanted to see what life was like on all of the other social networks. So if I shared the same photo with similar sentiment um, on Facebook or on Twitter or on Google Plus, you know, would it have the same reaction? Is there even the same audience who's using that those other networks? So I decided I have nothing to lose, really. <laughs> I'm still in school. I, you know, I would rather play around with this stuff than do my work. Um, and so I started posting to Facebook. Google Plus had just come out, and I got a beta invite. I started posting there. And I got such a really beautiful response when I started sharing. And it really encouraged me not only to share more, but also to combine my writing with my photography. Because those two worlds still you know, sort of existed separately for a short period of time, because I've written since I was little, but I never really thought about the joy that it would bring me to mix the two together until a lot of people on Google Plus um, were very supportive and encouraging about my writing and asking to see more of my writing combined with the photography. So I started sharing a lot. Um, I amassed this like enormous audience of two million people somehow on all of these networks. And I started um, being asked to speak. Um, and I turned down most of my public speaking gigs <laughs> at first because earlier on when I had first put myself through college, um, I had taken a public speaking class and I had such intense stage fright that like I would almost throw up when I had to like do my presentations. And I thought, no, 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 like there's no way I'm going down this road where I'm going to be this photographer who does public speaking. Like that's not me. I'm not putting myself in that situation. Um, but a very good friend of mine named Lotus Carroll, who's a great photographer, she had gotten um, a request to do a panel for women um, bloggers and we were gonna speak about social media, and I was like, I can't turn her down, she's this great person, so I said yes. So I said yes, and I showed up, and I did the panel, and it was this really, really great experience. I had a really great time doing it. I didn't have stage fright once I got up on the stage with her, and we just had a really wonderful time. And around that time, I had this huge social media following 
but I wasn't able to make photography a career yet. So people would ask me questions like, wow, so you have 2.5 million people following you. How does it feel to have so much financial success? And literally, I told this like audience of 200 people, like, I'm starving. <laughs> I don't have any financial success. I can't figure out how to make this work. <laughs> and that's like the total honest truth. And I just wanted to be honest. Um, and one of the people who was sitting next to me on the panel, um, who had, they had added in last minute, was a very, very successful, amazing person and photographer named Lisa Bettany. She was the co-founder of a photography app called Camera Plus, which is one of the most popular um, iOS photography apps. And so somebody asked me in the audience, well, but like, what's your goal? Like, where are you going with this? And I'm like, I want to be Lisa when I grow up, <laughs> as a joke. Um, well, it turns out that I guess she liked the joke, because two weeks later, she hired me. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is, this is awesome. Um, and it was also at that point that I decided I needed to not pursue the um, pre-med route. <laughs> and I ended up just sort of graduating um, with a degree in English literature and theory just to get the degree and get out of school. Um, and the other very fortunate thing that happened when I took that chance and decided to do that panel was that somebody from Sony was in the audience. And they had um, said to the person who had arranged the panel, you know, it would be so nice if in the world of women photographers there was somebody who actually shot with Sony. You know, it's all like Canon and Nikon people. And the person who had arranged the panel was like, Vivian shoots with Sony. <laughs> so we got in touch with each other and we started this really beautiful friendship. And um, I was able to start working with Sony eventually because of that experience. Um, and so, I mean, I think. I think it's a really interesting thing to speak about and to sort of like think about when I look back, because if I had never taken that chance and never said yes to speaking on the panel, I would have never known that I love public speaking. I would have never gotten, gotten in touch with Sony. I would have never gotten the job with Camera Plus, which was an amazing experience. Um, and I would have never met a lot of the people that I met because of it. So just taking that chance and saying yes to that really led to a lot of different things for me. Um, and so partnering with Sony was a really great experience because originally when I was partnered with Sony, I got to try out a lot of gear, which is something that um, obviously I didn't have a lot of experience with because I had gone from a point and shoot to um, the Sony A55. And you know, it was it was really interesting. So I would get gear that would get loaned to me for like a very short amount of time. And I would go out and I would be like, oh my god, I only have this amazing epic camera for like two weeks. I need to shoot every epic iconic thing I can think of because I'm never gonna have this camera again, because I couldn't afford these cameras. <laughs> so I would get like this awesome camera with this great lens, and I would literally go out and shoot like every single iconic scene I could think of. <laughs> Just to build my portfolio up and to get a lot of practice with like really great equipment and kind of get a feel for something that I would love to have when I had more money to spend and invest in the equipment. So I did that for a little while. And um, I'm going to fast forward to last year. Um, and the reason why I'm fast forwarding to last year is because so something that I always wanted to do, and I think that a lot of people want to do, is I wanted to travel the world and somehow make money doing it <laughs> artistically. And I think that that's a dream that a lot of people have. And I always had this dream, but I thought it was completely unobtainable. And I thought, there's no way. Like, maybe that's something that'll happen for me in like 20 years. You know, it's just not going to happen for me in my career now. Um, but. What was really interesting is that I, I ended up meeting a bunch of people last year. And I think that this is another valuable lesson that I can share with everybody if you are interested in photography and kind of like advancing your career. I met people who weren't specifically involved in photography, but who were involved in the travel industry. And meeting those people and kind of learning how 
they made a success and they had built their careers kind of helped me to understand how I could possibly do the same for myself. So broadening my horizons and sort of getting out there and you know meeting these people offline in you know situations like this you know where i could meet people at meetups or go to events it was really helpful for me to like make certain connections and kind of pick other people's brains and be like how how did you ever get to write about food and wine <laughs> in france you know like how how do people get jobs like that um, and so I made some really great friends um, in the travel industry um, and through a really good friend of mine there, I was introduced to France. Um, and this is a top question that I get, so I just want to cover it now really quick. <laughs> so basically, um, every single country and every single city, um, province, region, locale has their own sort of tourism company or destination marketing organization. Sometimes it's connected to the government. So in terms of France, it's run by the French government. Um, in terms of New York, we have our own. Obviously, you guys have probably seen a lot of stuff from like New York State tourism or New York City tourism. Um, and when a lot of those places are always looking to hire artists or people who do work in the creative industries to sort of look at their locales in a different way and bring their locales to those people's audiences. So I ended up going to a really great, wonderful event that was hosted by France. Um, it was this beautiful, very fancy event in Midtown. And my friend who had invited me was supposed to introduce me to all the people there. And I got there, and she texted me as soon as I got into the event. And she said, I'm so sorry, but my kids are sick. <laughs> and I was like, great. <laughs> Here I am. I know absolutely nobody um, at this amazingly swanky event. I'm just going to go in and talk to absolutely everyone, because I don't even know who I'm supposed to be talking to. So I literally did that. I made my round around the room and talked to everybody, told everyone what I did had some really great conversations. Um, and the next morning, just like anyone else would do, I sent a follow-up email. <laughs> and I said, hi, um, I got your card last night. It was really great being at your event and meeting you guys and having these conversations and all those good things that you would write in a follow-up email. And I never got a response. <laughs> so I said, great. Um, clearly, it was one of those nights where everyone was having a great time. You know, it was France. There was lots of wine. Um, I don't know. I'm just going to chalk this up to like being a great experience and nothing more. So two months later, and this was January of 2014, um, I got an email asking if I wanted to go to Paris to do a commission trip by the country of France to shoot Paris in the style that I shoot New York. Um, and so that all happened, and I could go into detail about that, but I'm not going to. But I think that th what was very interesting about that is, one, it forged a new relationship with me in France. Um, so I went to France many times last year, and it was a really great experience. And my next book is actually about Paris, and I'm working on that this year. Um, but it also just, again, kind of solidified for me that you know, there's certain opportunities that you just sort of need to take when they come up and kind of embrace wholeheartedly, even if you're completely freaked out and don't know anybody at the swanky event that you're going to. Um, <laughs> so now I, I do a lot of travel work. My main client is currently France. Um, but I do work with other locales. And a lot of it is basically, it's either commission shoots where I'm commissioned to go to a certain locale and shoot that locale and then share it with my audience and then also have the photos used for like ad campaigns or other things. Or I work with the locale and they will set me up with clients specifically in a certain city um, who need things specifically shot in my style. So I'm very fortunate in that I get to do things in my style. I don't really get um, jobs where people are like, hi, can you just shoot this like straight up shot? Um, 
if you guys have been looking at a lot of the photos, you could probably tell that I'm very much um, a very fantastical photographer. I'm more interested in like how things look in my mind versus how they actually look in reality. So I've been extraordinarily fortunate with my travel career in that, you know, so far people have sort of embraced that whimsy and that sense of imagination. And so I've come to this photo, and this is a really great time to sort of talk about this. So another thing that I do around here is that while I still shoot New York, and a lot of it I shoot passionately for myself, and then my work gets commissioned after the fact, um, sometimes it is commissioned beforehand. So I was contacted by The Guardian this past autumn, um, and they asked me to shoot for an article that was coming up about September 11th. And initially, when I had the phone call with the editor from The Guardian, I was really apprehensive because I flashed back to my time working for um, the hyperlocal news blog and the other things that I sort of started doing, which was like I shot a lot of parades at first just to sort of figure out like shutter speed <laughs> and also figure out like if I enjoyed doing that sort of shooting, like event shooting. Um, and so I sort of was really apprehensive in my conversation with him. And he was like, look, I'm not telling you to go and do a photojournalistic piece. I want you to do Vivian. <laughs> like, I want to see the World Trade Center, and I want to see the stuff that you see from the World Trade Center the way you see it, and then we will feature it in um, a gallery. So it was this like, brilliantly beautiful paid shoot that I did for them. Um, and I had this really beautiful access to this was taken at the top of four World Trade Center, which is not publicly accessible. And I got to meet the official um, World Trade Center photographer. They have one since 2004. And he's this just really brilliant, understated man who's been shooting the progress of the World Trade Center site for all these years. And he's got all these epic photos in his office. And he was just this super sweet, down-to-earth person. And it was a really great experience. So that's something that I do here in New York when I'm here between traveling um, is I'll do like commission shoots like that or I'll just go out and I'll shoot stuff specifically for me but knowing um, I guess that's a bad way to put it I'll shoot stuff for me hoping that it will get used eventually <laughs> so for example um, I've shot stuff for like Coach and Donna Karen um, where they've come to me about stuff that I've shot that they found online, and then they commission it to be used for like a campaign. So like the winter campaign for Coach was uh, a few of my Skyline photos that I've taken over the years. And they were made even more whimsical than I had already made them, which was hilarious. Um, so that's basically how I make my living. Um, another part that I think that I left out, which I should probably also explain, is very early on, Something that really helped get me found online was my sense of timing. Um, so I learned very early on when I was shooting parades and when I was shooting events that if you want people to find your work, you have to title it properly, you have to tag it properly, and you need to make sure you're one of the first people to have it up there. So for a lot of the parades that I covered or events like Manhattan Henge, which is this crazy sunset that happens twice a year here, I would go out, shoot, come back, and at a breakneck pace, edit my photos, and put them immediately up online so that BuzzFeed would pick it up, or Boing Boing, or any of those sites that were viral at the time would basically pick them up. And that's something that sort of taught me a lot about timing and about the importance of timing with the internet, especially in this day and age, if you're trying to craft a career out of being found on the internet, you need to make sure that your stuff is timely and that you're getting it up properly and that you're using proper descriptions. Um, and so something that a lot of people email me about is, how come the titles of your photos are so boring but you write so beautifully? <laughs> And the reason is because we live in a world that's sort of governed by search engines, by Google, or by whatever the search engine is that's being used. Um, and because of that, the titles of my photos are all very much search engine friendly. And that's, at this point, I would say 90% of my clients find me via Google Images um, or via my website, which is 
the top for a lot of search terms right now. Um, and so it was kind of like forging my way and, and you know, swimming my way through this weird world of internet stuff, trying to figure out like, you know, how I could get featured early on because I was really like looking to kind of have people notice my work that let me figure that out. So one of the main projects that I do now is I photograph New York City in the snow. Usually it has to be a really, really bad snowstorm for me to photograph it. Um, we haven't had too many of those this year, which has been very sad. But again, that sense of timing still informs what I do. So if I do go out in a blizzard or, or a snowstorm, like this was taken last year dur during one of the actual blizzards that we had. Um, I do actually come home after walking like seven miles in the snow, and I will immediately do my edits of my photos and put them up immediately because I'm still trying to like make sure that the timing is there. So even though I know that this stuff, I want it to be evergreen and I want it to exist online as like, if you're searching for New York snow photos, I want you to find my images and hopefully like them and maybe want to use them for an ad campaign. But I also want to make sure that they're up like super fast because it works. <laughs> so that's just like another element of how I've sort of crafted my career and how I still pretty much operate online. Um, this was another snowstorm. I think this was two, year, two years ago during the day. Um, my, my typical work now with snow is at night. I'm really interested in sort of like capturing that weird, magical, nostalgic quality of snowstorms at night. So I do a lot of photos of this, like in Times Square. Um, and that's pretty much where I'm at. Or I do, I do a lot of work also for hotel chains. So this was shot specifically for a hotel chain in Midtown um, who kind of asked for a very whimsical sci-fi type take on Times Square, which I was all about because Blade Runner is one of my favorite movies. Um, so this was sort of my like homage to Blade Runner, um, overlooking Times Square from the window of their hotel. And just to wrap things up, another thing that I'm really, really devoted to exploring, both with New York photography and with my travel photography, is nostalgia. So I'm really interested in different forms of nostalgia. Um, specifically forms of nostalgia that we don't specifically have words for in the English language. So there's two words that I'm, I'm obsessed with, and one of them is a Portuguese word, saudaja, which is a longing or a deep longing for something, and then zenzucht, which is a German word that means roughly a longing for a place that may not exist in reality, but makes you feel like it's home. So a lot of what I try to do with the color work that I do with my photos, like for example this um, Tribeca Cafe, is I'm really interested in exploring how those tones make people feel, um, or how they make me feel initially, and then seeing if it resonates with other people online, um, and seeing if it kind of provokes the same emotions that I feel when I see a scene like this with the ghost sign and with the umbrellas and that kind of interesting, um, the red of the brick. So that's something that I'm still exploring a lot. I'm exploring it a lot with my snow photos again at night, um, kind of just sort of trying to convey the feeling I feel when I walk in the snow and how it makes me feel like when I was little and I walked in the snow and just never wanted the nights to end because it was just super, super magical for me. Um, a question that I get a lot about my snow photos is, um, do I shoot on a tripod? <laughs> how do I stop from freezing to death? And how, how do I keep my camera dry? Um, so I do not shoot on a tripod. It would be impossible to shoot these photos on a tripod because I literally only have half a second to shoot these scenes. When the snow is really, really crazy in these storms and there's like wind gusts of 60 miles an hour, you really don't have the time to like futz around with a tripod 
And, you know, there's a whole method to my madness when I'm shooting in the snow. Um, so to keep my camera dry, which also plays into how I shoot, I have my camera, I attach a plastic bag, literally a hefty bag, over the lens, um, the thicker the better, and I cut a little corner out of the bag, I stretch it over the lens, and then I attach the hood on. And I carry my camera uh, pointed downward so that the hood is basically catching all of the snow and the hefty bag <laughs> is protecting the body and the lens. So even though my bodies now are pretty much all weatherproof because I'm shooting with a lot of the really great newer Sony stuff and it's weatherproof, a lot of my lenses are not. So I want to make sure that my lens is not getting like bombarded with snow. Um, but it also means that I shoot with my camera on 100% of the time. I also still shoot in manual. Um, I have shot in manual since the beginning, since that person on the internet said to shoot in manual. So I still shoot in manual. So when I'm shooting in the snow, I have to do adjustments every single block. Um, only because light can change so drastically from block to block, um, depending on the light and how the light is getting diffused with the street lights and the snow blowing and everything like that. So um, I do do those little adjustments. For a shot like this, I waited 45 minutes to get the perfect lineup of, I wanted a person walking that way, I really wanted a person crossing the street that way, and I wanted, when I first got there, the amount of snow that was on the awnings wasn't quite what I wanted. Um, <laughs> so I waited about 45 minutes. Um, I do dress like I'm in uh, the Arctic when I go out. Um, so I do have like a balaclava over my face. Um, I usually, now I have goggles. Um, I didn't last year and it really hurt my eyes and my eyes are so valuable to me right now. So I, I do wear goggles now even though I hate them. Um, and you know, I typically have like snow pants, huge snow boots, you know, layers. So I'm not usually cold when I'm shooting. I also have like huge thin slit gloves. Like it's not attractive. Um, and what I'll do is I have another glove that I have underneath that I have like, it's very thin so that when I do take my hands out to shoot, I still have something protecting my skin so I'm not getting um, frostbite situations. When I first started shooting in the snow, I didn't have enough money to buy snow gear. And the very first snowstorm that I shot was in like 2010, and I almost got frostbite. <laughs> and it was awful. Like I shot the East Village, and I kept having to like duck into places. And I didn't understand about condensation with cameras uh, and how bad that is. Because if you duck into a place when you're in extreme cold and snow, you run into condensation problems on your lens and often with the sensor inside. So in fact, when I do shoot snow now, I definitely don't duck in anywhere, um, only because I can't for condensation issues. And I also like rain. I just really love inclement weather. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, you know, it's just, for me, a lot of it is about just kind of treating scenes as if it's this immense dream backdrop for me. So like, I'll find a scene like this and I'll just like stand there for however long it takes until the right character walks into the scene. Um, for this one, I think it was like 30 minutes or something. And she was perfect. All right. So I mean, I, I want to thank b &H again for this. This was really great. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out in this ridiculous cold. <laughs> Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.